Greetings all, and welcome to the very first episode of TM, Technical Movement. With these sorts of videos, it's my goal to go beyond just understanding how Pokemon function, the behavior and biology that define them, but also now analyze their moves, and how they are executed, the elemental attributes and effects involved in them, and how they can best be countered in the heat of battle. For today, we are going to be taking a look at the Tackle, Takedown, Double Edge, Pound, Slam, Rage, Flail, Stomp, Vice Grip, and Constrict Attacks. Much as its name suggests, the Tackle Attack involves a simple full body charge into the opposition with little strategy or specialty features added, making it a quick and dirty way to deal some damage without much effort. What determines whether or not a Pokemon can use a Tackle Attack is primarily dependent upon the mass of the user and its physical strength but the simplicity of its design makes it easy for Pokemon of nearly all shapes and sizes to utilize it effectively in battle. Since the full body charge that defines this attack can be executed rather quickly and without a whole lot of space, it's perfect for close quarters combat and can allow even Pokemon with no other forms of offense to deal considerable damage to the opposition while expending relatively little stamina. Unlike related attacks, the tackle attack is interesting in that its method of deliverance can be altered significantly without actually altering the properties of the attack in turn giving trainers a bit of versatility that they otherwise would be lacking early on. Simply put, a Pokemon that can tackle an opponent on the ground, in the air, from any side, and without any appendage striking first. The only necessity is that the user strikes with its full body without pushing itself to the point of causing recoil damage. Furthermore, because of its quick execution time and limited required space, the tackle attack is generally quite hard to dodge and can strike opponents easily of any size or shape as long as they are within range. Not surprisingly, the vast majority of Pokemon that learn the tackle attack gain access to it almost immediately upon birth, in turn cementing the attack's universal nature and simplicity. Since the tackle attack requires a full body charge, it is fairly difficult to counter the attack with physical force alone, which is only made worse by the fact that the attack is also exceptionally difficult to dodge in close quarters. Armor can, however, help reduce or negate the damage dealt by this attack. The tackle attack is extremely fundamental, and thus is little more than a way to buy time until a Pokemon can get access to more powerful attacks, but even then, it is a move the beginning trainers will learn to stand by as a readily executed attack that can be launched at any time in battle, and thus one beginning trainers should look out for. The takedown attack is effectively a reckless full body charge into the opposition designed to knock them to the ground and inflict considerable physical trauma at the expense of the user's own well-being. Although it is performed almost exactly like the basic tackle attack, the takedown attack is far stronger because the Pokemon using the move is delivering the blow at full force without caring about potentially damaging itself in the process. This sort of reckless feature heavily increases the amount of damage actually done by the attack, but only increasing its stamina cost by a fairly small amount, which is primarily the result of not needing to expend extra energy to precisely target an opponent or strike them in a specific way. However, this lack of precision not only makes the attack fairly inaccurate, but also extremely dangerous to the Pokemon utilizing it, because the amount of force being dealt to the opposition is directly reflected inwards in the form of a concussive backlash. In short, the user will receive 25% of the damage dealt to the opponent in the form of recoil damage every time the attack strikes. The move's relatively high base power only makes the chance of exceptional damage that much higher, but at the same time it hopes to compensate for the reckless behavior of the user. The takedown attack might not be very effective in taking down multiple opponents over the course of a long battle or even several battles, but for a one-on-one -on -one encounter, it can get the job done fairly quickly without costing too much stamina in the process. It is lastly interesting to note that, despite its self-destructing tendencies, Silphco decided to go out on a limb many years ago when it released the attack as TM09 in their first generation line of TMs in the hopes of making it more popular. The plan failed though and the TM was quietly discontinued afterwards, though it was given a second chance very recently as TM001 in the 9th generation line of TMs. Since the takedown attack involves a full body charge, it is fairly difficult to counter the attack with physical force alone. Thankfully, fairly agile Pokemon should be able to still dodge the attack with close quarters. Strong armor in general can also help reduce or negate the amount of damage dealt by this attack, but weaker armor is unlikely to perform as well without sustaining critical damage or failing altogether. Overall, the takedown attack is a fairly risky move that forces trainers to place the well-being of their own Pokemon in danger to deal large amounts of damage, so it is unlikely that it will be seen outside of fairly desperate situations unless the opposition is fairly risky to begin with. Even so, it is advised that the attack should always be dodged if the evasive tactics are available, as the damage sustained from the move can still be fairly large in some cases, even with strong defenses on one side. The double edge attack is effectively a violent full body tackle delivered with such force that it could potentially break the user's internal structure, potentially inflicting lethal damage on both sides in the process. Although the double edge attack is practically identical to the takedown attack in that it is a reckless tackle that causes a considerable amount of force delivered to be reflected inward in the form of a concussive backlash, 
and thus inflicts 33.33% of the damage done back onto the user in the form of recoil, the double-edge attack is exceptionally risky and should probably be avoided in battle if at all possible. For one thing, the double-edge attack is far more powerful because the user is not simply throwing its entire body at the opposition without care, it's doing it deliberately. As a result, the Pokémon using the attack can build up considerably more momentum and maintain it throughout the duration of the attack, delivering devastating amounts of damage in the process. While this makes the attack as accurate as a standard tackle attack, it also places the user in more danger than most trainers actually realize. In short, the sheer force delivered with a double-edged attack is often enough to actually damage or even shatter the internal framework of the user, placing them in a life-threatening danger every time the move is used. The attack is truly one of desperation and is really used by trainers unless they are fully confident about the Pokémon's abilities, but even then they can never truly be certain, as the double edge attack's method of execution differs from Pokémon to Pokémon and from moment to moment. The move can certainly deal tremendous amounts of damage accurately and for relatively little stamina, but for what it's worth, it's still probably a better choice to rely on other moves unless no other option is available. It is interesting to note though, that Silph Cold thought that it could solve the problem of the move's low popularity by releasing it as TM10 in their first generation line of TMs. This proved to be a complete failure however, in turn prompting them to discontinue the TM shortly afterwards. Since the double edge attack involves a full body charge, it is fairly difficult to counter the attack with physical force alone, which is only made worse by the fact that the attack is also exceptionally difficult to dodge in close quarters. Strong armor in general can also help reduce or negate the amount of damage dealt by this attack, but weaker armor is unlikely to perform as well without sustaining critical damage or failing altogether. Overall, the double edge attack is extremely risky and forces trainers to place the well-being of their own Pokémon in danger to deal large amounts of damage, so it is unlikely they will be seen outside of fairly desperate situations unless the opposition is fairly risky to begin with. Even so, Pokémon with strong defenses and heavy armor are heavily recommended for taking the brunt of the attack's force, as unarmored Pokémon are likely to take catastrophic damage when the attack connects. In essence, the Pound attack is primarily differentiated from the Tackle attack, in that it involves only partial contact with an opponent and not complete contact, striking the opposition with a long tail of forelimb and close quarters with considerable force. Unlike the Tackle attack, the Pound attack does not require the user to come into complete bodily contact with an opponent to deal damage, and is thus less risky to use in battle as it allows a faster recovery time between strikes. The obvious drawback to this advantage is a slight decrease in the overall damage dealt due to a drop in overall momentum, but not enough to really be discerned in a fight. This can make battles more difficult for trainers if a quick victory is needed, but in terms of long-term endurance, pound attacks prove to be much more effective than tackle attacks in more tactical fights. Most importantly though, because the pound attack can be executed quite quickly and within relatively tight spaces, it is effectively impossible to dodge under normal circumstances and requires little stamina on the user's part to use. Unfortunately, because of how simple the move is to execute and its limited ability to do anything other than direct damage, it is often very difficult to utilize properly against more experienced opponents without risking a serious counterattack. As such, it is usually quite rare to see the attack be used in professional combat unless a desperate situation calls for a quick hit, though it is still a move the beginning trainers will have to get used to in their early journeys. Since an opponent must use an appendage of some sort in order to execute a pound attack, striking or otherwise damaging the offending appendage can help reduce or negate the damage dealt by this attack. Otherwise, however, the attack is exceptionally difficult to dodge in close quarters. Armor can, however, help reduce or negate the damage dealt by this attack. The pound attack is extremely fundamental, and thus is little more than a way to buy time until a Pokémon can get access to more powerful attacks. But even then, it is a move the beginning trainers will learn to stand by as a readily executed attack that can be launched at any time in battle, and thus one beginning trainers should look out for. As with the pound attack, the slam attack involves a forceful blow from a long tail of forelimb, though due to the way the attack operates, different anatomical objects, like long vines, can also be substituted to add a bit more versatility to the move. Although the pound and slam attacks function quite similarly, most Pokémon can only learn one of them and not both. This difference stems from both anatomical variety and the overall physical capabilities of the user. In order to use a pound attack, a Pokémon must be able to deliver considerable force with a blow within a fairly short period of time, but it does not necessarily have to be incredibly mobile to do so, as is the case of the Grimer family. The slam attack, on the other hand, relies not just on the actual force delivered in the attack, but also the momentum with which it is delivered. In a way, the attacks can be compared to using a regular hammer and a sledgehammer to strike a nail. The pound attack, because of its quick execution time, can allow a perfect hit while not requiring the user to be particularly mobile. On the other hand, the slam attack is designed to be a more powerful, potentially armor-breaking attack, and is slower to execute because it takes longer for an average individual to build up enough momentum to strike with a force capable of actually breaking through weak armor. As seen with the sledgehammer though, this also makes it much easier for the user to miss the target, making the move relatively difficult to pull off in close quarters and almost impossible to properly use at a distance. 
Nonetheless, the high damage capabilities of the move, and the fact that it can be learned by a decent variety of Pokémon, makes it a favorite move among trainers that are otherwise limited in their combat options. Since an opponent must use an appendage of some sort in order to execute a slam attack, striking or otherwise damaging the offending appendage can help reduce or negate the damage dealt by this attack. If this is not an option, however, relatively agile Pokémon should still be able to dodge the attack in close quarters. Strong armor in general can help reduce or negate the amount of damage dealt by this attack, but weaker armor is unlikely to perform as well without sustaining critical damage or failing altogether. The slam attack might not be accurate enough to be a reliable move in most cases, but if the opposition does have access to it, it is still a decently powerful strike that should be avoided at all costs, or at least countered with strong defenses. The actual execution of the rage attack differs between Pokémon and Pokémon, so a full description is impossible. What can be said, however, is that the move is perfect for young trainers that are looking to earn an advantage against a defensively minded opponent for relatively little cost. The rage attack is basically a strike delivered on adrenaline alone, without any real coordination or preparation beforehand. When first used, the rage attack sets the user's adrenal gland into a sort of standby mode, while the user attacks with a ferocious, but relatively weak blow. If the user is struck immediately by an attack after using rage, or is hit by an unsuccessful disable technique, the adrenal gland instantly releases a massive amount of adrenaline into the systems, immediately increasing their attack stat. This effect can be repeated multiple times through continued rage attacks, but the user can still choose to strike with a different attack if rage is no longer garnering a desired effect. Although its implications and uses can be wide in some cases, the limited damage the attack is capable of actually dealing is still a major downfall and often leaves it less desirable in major tournament settings. Interestingly enough though, Silph Coast saw quite a bit of potential with the move when it first began preparing TMs and decided to release the move as TM20 within the first generation line of TMs. Unfortunately, its relatively low damage made it relatively unpopular among most trainers at the time, so it was eventually discontinued in favor of more versatile options. Since the actual execution method differs between Pokémon, it is difficult to give a full synopsis on physically countering the rage attack. In general though, it is usually exceptionally difficult to dodge in close quarters. Armor can thankfully help reduce or negate the damage dealt by the attack. Although the rage attack is nice in that it guarantees a stat boost as long as the opposition strikes back immediately afterwards, its limited payoff and low damage potential nonetheless make it a move recommended only among beginning trainers or those who would otherwise prefer to take risks in battle instead of playing it safe, in turn making it an unlikely move to encounter in serious battles. Much as its name suggests, the flail attack is effectively a strike delivered to the opposition while the user is aimlessly flailing about. In this manner, the flail attack is effectively nothing more than a massive nerve response to trauma inflicted on the body. When this move is used, the user's brain will wildly send out electrical signals to the user's muscles, causing them to contract rapidly and uncontrollably, and in turn forcing the user to literally flail about without much in the way of bodily control. Due to the mechanics of the attack, the nerve response generated is completely dependent upon how active the user's pain receptors are at any given time, which in turn serves to reflect the amount of damage they have sustained in battle. As such, the amount of damage actually dealt by the attack increases as the Pokémon takes damage, starting out at a measly base power of 20 and topping out at 200 when the user has less than 5% of its maximum HP left. Unfortunately, because this move is completely dependent upon how damaged the user is, its applications are virtually limited to extremely desperate situations. Nonetheless, the ability to deliver a blow as powerful as a self-destruct attack in the worst of situations is a powerful strategy that few trainers can look completely away from, especially if you have an item like a Focus Band or Focus Sash with them. Because an opponent using a flail attack has no control over their body and will not actively respond to physical pain until after the attack is finished, it is exceptionally difficult to dodge or counter the move in close quarters. Strong armor in general can help reduce or negate the damage dealt by this attack, but weaker armor is unlikely to perform as well without sustaining critical damage or failing altogether at higher power levels. The flail attack is not one that you're likely to see until near the end of a battle, but that also means that it should be prepared for extensively. If a Pokémon is not able to finish off the opposition completely with a powerful strike, the potential of a complete turnover in battle can become a real threat that often only strong defenses will be able to handle fully. Much as its name suggests, the stomp attack involves stomping the opposition with a large foot or hoof, and turn inflicting considerable physical trauma in the process. As with many other fundamental attacks, the capacity to learn the stomp attack is primarily dependent upon the basic anatomical arrangement of a Pokémon. In this case, only Pokémon that either have hard hooves that can be brought down forcefully, or especially large and sturdy feet that can do likewise, can normally learn the attack. Even with these restrictions though, the number of Pokémon capable of performing a stomp attack correctly is still a little bit limited compared to others. This is apparently because a certain combination of bone and muscle system interactions are needed to probably deliver such damage without experiencing recoil. Regardless, the stomp attack is a fairly strong blow that deals decent damage for its stamina cost and has considerable stopping power. 
enough in fact to give the attack a 30% chance of causing the opponent to flinch every time it lands first. While this equally means that it's unaffected by items like King's Rocks, this attribute nonetheless makes the attack a powerful move for controlling the opposition in close quarters. The attack also has one other property that makes it particularly valuable in the right circumstances. Ordinarily, the attack has a set base power of 65, and it stays that way under nearly all conditions. If, however, the opposition has used a minimized technique to at least temporarily reduce its body size, the base power for Snob Attack will be doubled to 130, and it is guaranteed to hit the target. This is because the total force of a Stomp Attack is delivered completely onto an opponent regardless of size, so the smaller they are, the more concentrated the overall force will be. In the right circumstances, this can make this otherwise simple and fundamental attack a game-changer capable of winning a battle under just about any situation. Since an opponent must utilize its legs in order to execute a Stomp Attack, damaging the appendages before the attack can connect can help reduce or even negate the amount of damage dealt by the attack. Otherwise, the attack is exceptionally difficult to dodge in close quarters. Strong armor in general, however, can help reduce or negate the damage dealt by the attack, but weaker armor is unlikely to perform as well without sustaining critical damage or failing altogether when the attack is at maximum power. The Stomp Attack is a fairly powerful move capable of dealing catastrophic damage in the right circumstances, so traditional evasive tactics might not work so well. As such, strong defenses and protection against flinching are highly recommended for taking the brunt of the attack's force until a reasonable counterattack can be made. The Vice Grip attack effectively involves squeezing an opponent from both sides with a pinch or a hinged body part to inflict physical trauma on both surface tissue and underlying structures. While the number of Pokémon unable to learn fundamental attacks like Tackle, Pound, or Scratch are fairly low, the fact that they do exist begs the question of how they manage to defend themselves at an early age at all. The Vice Grip attack is one of many solutions that nature has provided some of these creatures, and in practice, it is more powerful than any of the other above-mentioned attacks. The Vice Grip attack is one that requires the user to be able to strike quickly and forcefully with an appendage in a vice-like fashion, in turn limiting the move among Pokémon related to crabs, some insects, and those that have an appendage of some sort capable of quickly clamping down the opposition without any elemental properties, like Mawile and the members of the Clink family, among others. The damage done by a Vice Grip attack is completely due to the pressure exerted by rapidly clamping down on an opponent, so it does not completely reflect the user's true physical attributes. If anything else, it merely reflects the amount of pressure their anatomy is capable of producing with a single strike. For Pokémon like Krabby, this means the amount of elastic potential energy that can be built up in the pincher muscles. For Durant, this means how strongly they can clamp with their jaws together, and so on. The Vice Grip attack might not have any special properties, but the fact that it's extremely hard to dodge and cause very little stamina to use makes it a great weapon for damaging the opposition when nothing stronger is available. Since an opponent must utilize some sort of clamping appendage to execute a Vice Grip attack, Striking otherwise damaging this appendage can help reduce the damage this attack can deal. Otherwise, however, the attack is exceptionally difficult to dodge in close quarters. Armor can also help reduce and even negate the amount of damage done by this attack, though weaker armor may end up buckling or breaking under the attack's extreme pressure. As far as basic attacks go, the Vice Grip is a strong one, but it's unlikely to be used much in professional combat. Even if it does become an issue, heavy armor can still render the move useless under most circumstances, and is thus the preferred method of dealing with the attack. Much as his name suggests, the Constrict attack is effectively nothing more than a simple restraining of the opposition that briefly immobilizes them and deals a small amount of damage in the process, usually by using a long tentacle or similar appendage to quickly squeeze an opponent tightly. Due to its specific specifications, Constrict normally cannot be learned by any normal type Pokémon, even though it is considered to be a normal type attack. This is because while the anatomical features needed to initiate the attack are not found in normal types, the damage done to the opposition is due to constriction pressure alone, and thus cannot actually be assigned a true elemental type other than the normal type. Under normal circumstances, this move is executed quite quickly, and is thus very hard to dodge, but its damage potential is so low that it is effectively pointless in many cases. However, the move does have one redeeming quality to it. In the act of restraining an opponent, the user of this move may create bustle cramps in its target from the sheer compression, and turn weakening their body and making it harder to move, consequently reducing the speed stat about 10% of the time. The fact that this also means that the move is unaffected by items like King's Rocks does limit its overall usefulness, but for Pokémon that otherwise do not have a way to readily defend themselves at birth, this weak move can prove to be of some use and can potentially give the user enough time to escape from a predator or opponent in the wild when they feel outmatched. Since an opponent must use an appendage of some sort in order to execute a constrict attack, striking otherwise damaging the offending appendage can help reduce and negate the damage dealt by the attack. Otherwise, however, it is exceptionally difficult to dodge in close quarters. Armor can, however, help reduce or negate the damage dealt by this attack. Since the Constrict attack is only a temporary constriction, its power and damage capabilities are very low and thus of little threat. Unless the opposition is using a very young Pokémon, it is unlikely to see this move much in battle and should thus not be a concern, 
Although its chances of lowering the target's speed can still be a bit of a problem and should be countered with fast Pokémon that can easily handle the loss of mobility if the opposition gets lucky. That's it for now, but look forward to the next set of moves here on TM Technical Movement. Thank you all for watching this video. It always brings me great joy to see others enjoying the work I do to try and make the world of Pokemon and the fascinating creatures that lay inside of it feel as real as they possibly can. If you really enjoy my work, please feel free to leave a comment and subscribe as I always do my best to respond to any and all comments that are left on my videos. In addition, if you wish to learn more about my work and help support it, you can find links to my Patreon page as well as email and other contact information to my work on DeviantArt in the video description down below. Furthermore, you can find a link to my Discord server there as well if you'd like to get a first glimpse at what videos are coming up next and converse with other fans of the world of Pokemon. Thank you for taking the time to watch this and have a wonderful rest of your day.